What's up folks? Today I'm going to talk about something that's vitally important and boring, and that would be ETL. Extract, transform, and load. The act of taking data from one place and moving it to another place and perhaps fiddling with it in transit. Uh, this is, it's kind of a boring thing, but these days it is the thing that is most likely to get somebody standing uh, at my cardboard cubicle and looking at me with disapproval because an ETL job has gone wrong somewhere. Mecklenburg uses GeoKettle. GeoKettle is an excellent tool. It's a fork of Kettle, which is a Java-based ETL tool that's spatially enabled. It's wonderful, it works great, and it's dead, I think. Project hasn't been updated for about five years now. It still works fine. That's a nice thing about Java apps is they can they generally keep on trucking, but it's super old and it's making me nervous. So I've been looking at different ways to replace GeoKettle in our ETL stack. And what I don't want to do is write basically a piece of software for every layer that I need to move around. A little bit of scripting is fine. If I have to write a big Python script custom for everything, no good. The other thing I don't want to do is I don't want to spend a metric ton of money on FME and FME server. Those things are purportedly wonderful. They're also incredibly expensive. And uh, it's another enterprise piece of software that I have to nanny. And I don't want to get into that either. So I've been looking at different things and I've done lots of stops and starts. And one thing I've latched onto recently, I think is very interesting, is uh, the OGR foreign data wrapper extension for Postgres. Now, back in the day when I was a SQL Server admin and, and generally uh, not super happy about that, SQL Server had something called a SQL linked server or something of that effect. And it's basically where you can connect to that that one SQL server to another SQL server and pretend that the data on that other SQL server is sitting on your server, except for like much slower. And that was, it was one of those things where you go, neat, uh, and I'm not gonna use that. But uh, the foreign data wrapper tooling in Postgres is awesome because you can use it to connect to just about anything. And while that connection to that data would be slower in almost all cases, like if you're connecting to a CSV file that's 300,000 lines long and doesn't have indexes on anything, that's going to be a lot slower than an indexed uh, table you have in Postgres. For doing an ETL job, the slow part isn't that bad because you don't really care. I mean, if it was molasses, you'd care, but it's generally fast enough for an ETL job. So I thought, huh, maybe I could use this. Maybe if there's a layer, say, in a shapefile or another PostGIS server or in SQL server, I can use the, uh, the Ogre foreign data wrapper to connect that server and pretend that table is on my server. And then when I want to do an e ETL job, move that data over, I'm just doing a insert into table, select whatever from this other table. And when it is doing that, I can do any kind of uh, transforms I want just through regular SQL. So the uh, OGR foreign data wrapper extension is part of, I think it's there pretty much everywhere for the official Docker, Ooh, bigger. Yes, people are old, need big fun. For the, uh, the uh, official Postgres Docker image, it's, it's there. It's just Postgres SQL dash whatever version, or 12 dash OGR dash FDW. And you can just install that along with Postgres. I also believe it's in the Windows post installer thing where you normally find PostGIS and stuff. I believe it's there as well. And this is just a foreign data wrapper using Ogre. And Ogre, of course, is awesome. So once you have that installed, 
as part of your system, you can just uh, do a create extension if not exists OGR FDW and you're good. That will show up in your extensions and happy day. You can use that. Now, it also the extension also comes with some command line tools for I think, convenience. And it's this OGR underscore FDW underscore something. So I can go info dash F. This is gonna give me all the formats it supports. And it looks like Ogre to me. You've got MS SQL, you've got kinds of file formats, CSV. Now you can get a different foreign data wrapper extensions specifically to different things. Like there's an FDW for uh, just for Postgres and there might be one for Oracle or whatever. And I thought it might be easier to do it all this with Ogre, even if it's a little less efficient because I'll get it all in one go and my syntax and code will largely remain the same. So we create this extension, all these formats, then you have to create two things to really use, uh, use the data from another location as if it was in your Postgres server. You have to have a foreign, uh, a, a server, which is essentially a map to another database server or directory or what have you. And then you have a table based on some table off in that server. So what I've done is I've created a directory that automatically mounts when my uh, PostGIS uh, Docker server starts. And it just has this ETL data folder. And in that ETL data folder, I've got some shapefiles. So what you can do, it's got these nice convenience things to it is I can look in that location and it'll tell me what layers are there. And then I can pick one of those layers from that location. What it's gonna make for me is the SQL code to make a server for that location and for that particular table, what that SQL is gonna look like. We're defining a table for Postgres uh, that uh, is our thing. And we can fiddle with this code as we want. I've got this code right up here. And I'm not going to call it my server because I'm just not. I'm going to give it an OGR server and give it some description. And it's just pointing that thing in a shapefile. And then I'm using this table code to vote to this voter polling location. I already have that, that polling location table sitting in Postgres natively as well. So when I make, right now I don't have any foreign tables. If I run this code, and this is where you can fiddle about with, uh, you know, anything you want here, uh, layer stuff and, and what have you, we'll just, create it as is. And we've created our foreign table. So now if I, I refresh this view, we'll see we have a foreign table. And now you can uh, select that and do your regular kind of stuff with it. So there's our, our happy table. And this table, uh, the fields and everything mirror straight to the uh, table sitting in Postgres as well. So we have our voter polling location native to Postgres, and we have a foreign table that's pointing at this shape file. Now all we need to do to do a, uh, uh, I've, I've made the fonts big for you, you people. Try me nuts, but you're welcome. So once we have that up, we can just do a simple Postgres transaction to do ETL. So here I am in a transaction. So if anything goes wrong, this is gonna roll back. And when I'm running this in PG admin, I click on auto commit and auto rollback. So if it runs into an error, it's just gonna roll it back. Otherwise you'll get into funny states where you have to explicitly do a rollback or, or something. So I just check both of those on. So we're going to truncate the polling, our local table, 
and then we're just going to insert everything from one table to another. And because the column names match, this is, should just work. Unless I, oh, oh, actually introduced an error when I was fiddling around there before. I'll fix that. So now we've committed, we've got our records in there. So we should have 195 records in our local table. Bada bing, bada boom. So we've got uh, in this four lines, we're truncating our table and bringing the data over. That's, that's really good. That's basically what my ETL jobs generally do. They don't do a whole lot more than that. Now you can go insert in deploying location and give it specific fields and then select fields or select, you know, cast this field to something else or concatenate these two fields into another field. So when you do this insert, you can do all of your transformation type stuff. So this isn't really e ETL, or there's an article I saw recently that said, now we do ELT, which reminds me of that song that goes, you know me, and it's, so that's, that's no good for that reason. This we're never really extracting per se, it's sitting where it sits. We're really just loading, and if we need to, we're fiddling with it while it loads. So our, basically these four lines of code, once that connection is set up, is our ETL job. You can also wrap uh, making a foreign data table and server into your ETL job. So I'm going to get rid of all that uh, foreign data server stuff with a cascade, so it's gonna get rid of the layer two. We can dump that stuff straight into our transaction. And we can also add uh, create foreign table, if not exists, that kind of thing. So now if we run this transaction, it's still gonna go through fine. We've permanently made uh, this uh, foreign data server and table. So we could also put in that tra transaction, getting rid of them at the end. But let's take that back out and let's see what happens. That would be handy if, if you've got, say, uh, if you've got, say, you may want to create a permanent server that connects to a folder, but people might just dump shapefiles in there, and you'll just look at the shapefile name through some other code, and then create foreign tables to those shapefiles just on the fly to do your transaction with them. So let's get back to where we were. Suppose we had some sort of error in this transaction, and run it. See, we're doing a truncate table first. If we look at our select count star from that now, we get 195. We're, since we're doing this truncate in the transaction, when it hits any kind of error, it's gonna do that automatic rollback. And we go back up and we see that truncate never really happened because it didn't get to the commit. Perfect, that's what we wanna see. We don't want stuff blowing up like that. So, neat. So this gives us a very basic simple bit of SQL with this foreign data wrapper to run our, our, uh, our ETL jobs. What you could also do as part of this, and I found this out uh, while I was investigating, because right now all of our ETL jobs are basically on timers. So our polling locations, uh, it grabs them from this one server like every week. Well, guess what, that polling location thing changes once or twice a year. Most of that time, that data is moving around for no reason. Now, Postgres has this MD5 and array aggregate functions that you can use to get a MD5 hash, which it's, it's kind of like a unique uh, key to a, a file. Like you get an MD5 hash when you're validating some files you've downloaded. So what you could do as well is say we get this, uh, our foreign data table, I think it's FID there, is this is giving us uh, MD5 hash for the state of that table. And this ends in E6D, neat. Well, let's go into that layer 
and let's uh, edit it. We'll add a point over here, and we don't we don't care about data, so we'll just add that point, and then we'll save that edit and go. So now when we we count those, we should get 196. Remember this ended in E. 6D. So now we have 196 records. Now when we get this uh, MD5, it ends in 023. So we have detected through this through this SQL call that there's been a change. So now before we run our transformation, we can run the SQL call, say, hey, did this thing change? Do we do we do we need to do anything here? And the answer might be. No, uh, you might want to get it all the time anyway, because you're weird. But you know, we can you can check that. The so that gives you that the other number one place where our jobs fail is when I copy data in from another table to refresh my table, but the other table was empty. That happens with some frequency. So another very simple bit of SQL you could run before you start your transaction is. How many records are in this table? If it's below a certain threshold, or if it's zero, stop. We run that as part of our GeoKettle scripts now, and you can run that with a, a similar little bit of SQL. So, isn't that neat? It's also fairly robust. If we go into our polling locations uh, and edit again, go into our fields, Let's say we get rid of this zone field and then we add a, a what up burger. That's a shape file. I don't want to make it too long, have it freak out on me. Oop. Well, I just deleted it. Why did I do that? Uh, let's add that again. Wait, 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 stop. I think I just did something bad there. Okay, I'm gonna edit this again. We will add a what field and we will get rid of the zone field and save it. Well, now that zone field we defined over here, we made that foreign table, it doesn't exist anymore. Is that a problem? Well, not really. It's not gonna kill you. What we'll see we select everything now is that zone field just comes in as null because it couldn't find a zone field in that shape file. Also, since we haven't defined the Whataburger field from there, it also isn't going to show up when we select all the fields from there. So it is fairly robust in terms of that, in terms of changes to the schema of the source table. You could also, let's just remove this, Let's just delete that uh, code. Uh, Docker, PostGIS, ETL data. Let's just delete that polling location file entirely. Now, when we go to select it, it's unable to connect to that layer. So you'll very quickly connect if, if we tried to uh, run this, it's also going to fail. And we will see that we didn't lose our polling locations from that truncate because it uh, could not find that file. Perfect. That's the kind of stuff we want from our ETL job. So this is what I'm, I'm playing around with right now. I could see myself setting up uh, basically you have a little bit of SQL that's something like this. Before that runs, you would have some tests. One to check your MD5 hash to see that it actually changed you to run. The other to check to say a record count to make sure there's stuff there. And then run that bit of SQL. And that is your ETL job. And since it's doing this MD5 change check, it's actually a little better than before. Asterisk. MD5 calculation for the whole table uh, is dependent on the size of the table. 
like our tax parcels has 350-ish thousand polygons. This is going to take several seconds to run. So if you have a table with say 18 billion polygons in it, doing this MD5 uh, check to see if the table changed is going to be a big performance bottleneck. But for Mecklenburg County size data, hey, this works fine. Anyway, that's what something I'm looking at. I think it's really cool and a big credit to uh, Paul Ramsey, etc. for the OGR FDW extension. Uh, and uh, also great credit. Uh, I'll link to this page where it goes through a lot of documentation. Great credit for calling this post Chris, FDW wraparound action rather than reach around action because that's what I would have called it because I'm a child. So I'll link to this uh, bit of documentation. It is very helpful. And this is really cool. How I would see myself implementing this is probably with a little bit of Node. You could really do it in Python or anything else. Node is just my bag right now. So you could use the uh, Node, uh, let's see. Uh, but bit of code here they have on transactions. You could uh, make a connection. You could run one SQL query to get a count and another to uh, check if it's changed. If both uh, if their both their count condition is true and the file has changed, and to detect that, you would need to store the current. MD5 of whatever that table is, then you can run your transaction right from here and do any kind of error check catching. So if this ran successfully, I would probably push to a file or a table a little status message saying this job ran at this date and did X. Or if it failed, I can go uh, email myself or uh, uh, write this job failed at this date for X reasons. So. That's how you're kind of writing a little bit of code for each layer that you want to do an ETL job for, but it ends up being, unless you're doing crazy transformations, really, really tiny. It could just be a two line transaction and you're good. So that's just something I'm fiddling with now and uh, big props to the, the Ogre FDW folks. And uh, it's really neat. If I get a working sample node project for this sort of thing, I will share the code with you. Right now, I'm still very much in the, oh, this is really cool. Let me see if I can figure out why it wouldn't work. And so far, I haven't. The only potential issue you might have is in order for this to work, your Postgres server has to be able to see the data either in a folder or if it's coming, say, from another Postgres server, it has to be able to see that other Postgres server. Whereas with an ETL server, what you need is that ETL server needs to see both of those servers, but those servers don't necessarily need to see each other. So you have to bear that in mind when you're thinking about networking, if you've got this up in a cloud, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond that, that's the only bit of limitation I can think of and it's been working really fast and really good. I hope you found that interesting. I'm gonna play with this more and when I get some decent code to share on how this might actually be implemented, I will share it. I'll talk to you later, bye-bye.